So thank you for having me here today, and uh, thanks to the Dean and to Nikolai for inviting me, and thanks to Josh for comparing me to Plutarch. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm quite at that level, but I appreciate the reference. Um, so as Josh said, I, I'm going to be talking a little bit, um, I'm not going to be talking so much about the book today about as about, I think, some of the things that I kind of thought about while I was writing the book and applying them to the present situation. Of course, when we get to the Q&A, you're welcome to ask me about the book or ask me about um, anything. But, but when I was invited to speak here, I, I really thought hard about um, how some of the things that I wrote about in the book might be relevant to today. And there's some obvious answers. There's a lot of political shifts going on right now. Um, there's a lot of intensity on the left. There's a lot of intensity on the right. I'm sure if we could see inside the minds of people across the country, we would see a lot of people moving in both directions um, in response to some of the things that are going on. Uh, the, the topic that I wanted to, to talk to you about, uh, and I'll go into it in a second, um, is primarily race. And um, there's a reason, there's a few reasons for that. One is it's, it's something that's, that's going on right now, but another one is that in two of the chapters, um, two of the people I wrote about in particular, uh, race played a kind of central role in the shift, uh, in their shift from the left to the right. So the stories of David Horowitz and Norman Podhoritz uh, would be impossible to tell without talking about uh, black and white and how those things play out on the left and right and how they play out in the individual psyche. So that's kind of the background for what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and before I go into it, I just kind of want to put my cards on the table in a, little, a little bit to this extent, which is I was raised on the left, I remain on the left. The book in a lot of respects is me sort of not trying to make a case for the left, but almost trying to make a case against the left. And it comes out of my own experience kind of wrestling with these issues as a child of the left. And so this is speaking in a way, this is sort of speaking in a way to the left, which I think is making some mistakes right now in terms of how it talks about race in ways that I suspect are dri unnecessarily driving people away from our position. So, so it's speaking to the left in a way, but I think you could flip it um, because I don't assume everybody here in the audience is coming from the same political perspective I am. I think you could flip it in a way um, and make not the same case, but a kind of inverse of the case to the right. So I hope to the people who are not coming from the same political perspective that I am, um, that you can hear in it as well a sort of challenge um, to your own perspective. And the final thing I'll, I'll say is, is um, you are welcome to be provocative in the Q&A uh, section and to challenge me. I always strive to be provocative and I almost always fail. Um, there's something in my temperament that, that drives me to try and uh, reconcile and, and find a way around exactly the way of saying it that will be, that will, that will anger people and say it in a way that it just kind of, kind of seeps in in a nice smooth way. Um, but maybe I'll succeed today. We'll see. Um, so I'm going to start. I'm going to start this part of it. In the early months of 2006, a man named Tim Lensmeyer did something fairly typical for a left-wing academic who writes about race. He went out into the field, in this case to the rural Wisconsin town where he grew up, and he interviewed a bunch of regular white folks on their feelings about race. What was unusual about what Lensmeyer did, and one reason why his findings are so essential, is that he didn't assume in advance that the interesting questions to answer would be about the degree and nature of his subject's racism. Not that he doubted it was there, the racism, in the psyches of many of his subjects and pervading the systems of privilege and power through which they moved and lived. He was, after all, a left-wing academic. His dissent was from the idea, which is so current among his fellow whiteness researchers and theorists, that that was all there was when it came to white people and their experience of race. That most white people are, as he said, simply the smooth embodiment of racism and white privilege. Also, and maybe as important, he dissented from the idea that white racism, when present, is as simple and smooth a thing as many of his anti-racist colleagues seem to believe. He suspected there was more, and he wanted to approach his subjects in a way that might elicit more complexity. So he didn't confront them with the kinds of hyper-politicized topics that come pre-soaked in racial signaling and symbolism, and therefore tend to elicit defensiveness and excessive caution. He started much softer. He asked them about their childhoods and their families. He asked them about their friends and colleagues. He asked how race played out in ways specific to their lives and to their local communities. Lensmeyer, who's now an associate professor of education at the University of Minnesota, did 22 of these in-depth interviews. 
In each one, he did his best, like a good therapist or journalist, to empathetically follow his subjects where they led, but also to intercede at strategic moments with a question or a challenge or a reframing. In this way, he elicited both the stories as his subjects told them to themselves, but also the hidden patterns that could emerge only under thoughtfully applied pressure. The discovery process was helped by the fact that he knew intimately their rural Wisconsin world. It was where his own whiteness took form. It was where he grew up. Over the past decade, he's been slowly, steadily mining these interviews for articles and book chapters, and he's been evolving as he goes an increasingly clear and rich vision of how white Americans experience race. This summer, he'll finally publish his book based on the research, White Folks, Race and Identity in Rural America, and the world will get its fullest articulation of that vision. I expect it to be excellent. Lensmeyer is a lucid and compelling writer, and he has that rare capacity to render obvious, simple truths that we've somehow known for a long time but never been able to articulate. Unless something unexpected happens, though, you won't read White Folks or even hear about it. It will be reviewed in a few academic journals, that's my son, he doesn't, he doesn't agree with everything that I say. <laughs> He's not that interested in my thoughts on race. Uh, <laughs> it will be reviewed in a few academic journals, studied, studied closely by a few white curious academics and otherwise suffer the fate of most academic books. To sit quietly for decades in the stacks at the university library accumulating dust, waiting and hoping for some student or scholar to happen upon it, happen upon it and be struck by what lies within. Lensmeyer himself, we can imagine, will go about his life of research, writing, and teaching in continued obscurity. And there's nothing tragic about that fate for Lensmeyer's book. He has a good job at a tier one university. He and his wife, also an academic, have cultivated a small community of colleagues who share their dissident perspective on whiteness. And publishing a book at all really is a good deal. Most people on the planet don't get to do it. Respectable obscurity isn't a tragedy for an academic, it's the job description. No offense to any academics in the room. <laughs> <laughs> the tragedy if Lensmeyer and his message remain obscure would be for the rest of us, mired as we are in a racial discourse that with every passing year seems to become more zero-sum, more polarized, and more toxic to our collective hopes for a just, flourishing, multiracial democracy. Because what he has to say to all of us, on the right and left, black and white and brown, red and yellow, is that it doesn't have to be this way. In the complexity and ambivalence of white identity, there is hope for us if we can see it and seize it. I think he's right, but to understand why, you have to go back to where he started with the white folks, and particular to a man named Frank, a white high school teacher in his 40s. Lensmeyer interviewed Frank twice for a total of about four hours. What emerged from these interviews was a picture of a man torn in his soul over issues of race. The conflict went back to Frank's earliest years and to his efforts to make sense of how his father and his uncle Norman talked about the Ojibwe Indians in the area, and in particular how their talk squared, or rather didn't square, with their own ways of being and behaving. The Ojibwe were resented by many whites in the area for the exemption they were granted as natives from local fishing regulations. Uncle Norman, in particular, found the disparate treatment infuriating. Oh, the Indians are stealing, Frank remembers him saying. They're drunks, all they're doing is drunken spear fishing, not doing anything sporting, and it's a bunch of shit. Their culture, they're not the same ones that were here 200 years ago. They should do what we have to do. If the memory had simply been that, Frank's racist uncle being a racist uncle, it would have been a familiar and not very interesting story. But even as a boy, Frank had known there was more complexity to it. He'd been with his father and his uncle many times when they'd flagrantly and knowingly broken precisely the rules they were angry at the Ojibwe for not having to follow. They'd overfished or killed deer that were too small. Young Frank had borne confused witness as well to the bogus rationalizations his father and uncle would cook up in case a game official caught them. We'd be fishing walleye, Frank remembers, and my dad would catch way over the limit. Well, some of the fish was mom's. Well, she actually wasn't here catching. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll say she went home early. There was hypocrisy, too, in Uncle Norman's dismissal of the Ojibwe as drunks and layabouts. He was a heavy drinker himself, and just in general, a disaster of a human being. <laughs> Frank's father was more functional than Norman, less volatile, and kinder to people on a day-to-day -day basis. But he was a partner in crime to his brother in ways that were obvious to Frank even when he was young. Lensmeyer says to him, but you saw this as a kid already? Frank says, well, yeah, they were just so obvious. And I don't think my dad's way of wrong was quite the level of Uncle Norman's level. But then again, I'm trying to justify my, better, my father better than my crazy alcoholic uncle. I know I'm doing that because I wonder at times when those two guys are out, who knows what evil? You know, I don't know what he was doing or shooting, and maybe he just left it at Norman's. <laughs> 
Even in this small glimpse, one can see how potent a brew nurtured Frank's racial awareness. There's the stereotyping of others and the obvious, even to a child, wrongness and hypocrisy of it. There's the powerful des desire to rationalize or ignore racism in order to preserve a sense of the essential goodness of beloved fathers and brothers. There are the ways that personal failures and disappointments get attached to race and imagined racial others, and there are layers upon layers of guilt and shame and confusion. At one point, and this is truly striking, Frank tells Lensmeyer about the dark places that his uncle can go when he's really in his cups. Frank says, I think Norman spent seven years in Vietnam. He decided to come back, and then another brother went over. His name was Eric, and he got killed. And then Norman went into the psychiatric hospital, spent a year there, and now to this day, he drinks heavily. But when he's drinking, and I've experienced this, he's broken down and cried, I think I might have been the guy that assassinated Martin Luther King, I'm not sure. This scene, Lensmeyer suggests, points to a kind of whiteness that doesn't fit easily into the prevailing frames. It's not the benevolent, colorblind indifference that conservatives believe is the default attitude of most regular white folks, nor is it the smooth embodiment of racism and white privilege that gets described in much, much of the contemporary left-wing literature on white racism, nor is it the straightforward civil rights multicultural orientation that many white liberals believe they have. It's something much more tangled. Embedded in the DNA of the white psyche is a sense of deep guilt over, but also deep connection to, the plight of other races. It's a guilt and connection and a sense of confused and often stifled obligation that ramifies throughout the white family and white community as well. One sees this over and over again in Lensmeyer's interviews. Dolores, an older white elementary school teacher, confesses to Lensmeyer that she was too passive and fearful during civil rights protests happening when she was a college student in the 1960s. She was afraid, she tells him, that if she got into trouble, her parents wouldn't let her come home. Decades later, her own daughter, now a student at the same state college where Dolores studied, takes a class on the 1960s and ends up reproaching her mother for not being more active. Dolores tells Lensmeyer, they had to write a poem in this class, and my daughter wrote about me not getting involved, and the title of the poem was From the Other Side of the Street. Robert, another interview subject, who's a high school teacher and a basketball coach, tells Lensmeyer about the time he chose to suspend a white player on his team for calling the team's only black player a nigger. He faced so much heat from the white parents that he ended up resigning. Stan, a dairy farmer, tells Lensmeyer about the first time he ever saw a black man. He was a kid and it was at the annual county fair. His mother took the opportunity to, quote, scare the living shit out of him and his siblings. She said that if they didn't behave, that big black man over there would abduct them and she wouldn't even try to get them back. William, a farmer, talks about his sister dating a black man and the rift it's caused in the family. He and his mother have been suspicious of the boyfriend and now his sister thinks they're racists. Lensmeyer writes, this is a accusation seemed to hurt William profoundly and I think this was exactly because he was ambivalent, conflicted inside. William not only knew about the racism of others, he felt it inside himself. However, he did not want to feel that way. Lensmeyer's subjects hold all sorts of racist or at least racially distorted ideas about people of color, particularly about black people. Yet they also seem to have genuine moral commitments to racial fairness and equality. They have insights about the nature of injustice and authentic desires to connect across racial boundaries. Dolores, a devout Catholic, is proud of her daughter and sees her willingness to go directly at issues of racial justice as a better expression of Catholic values than her own passivity was. Stan was overweight as a boy and remembers how people underestimated and stereotyped him because of his weight. The experience seems to have given him some imaginative access to what it might be like for people of color to be misjudged and discriminated against. Late at night when he's watching documentaries on the History Channel and footage of the civil rights movement comes on, he sees his own struggle reflected in the lives of Martin Luther King and other civil rights figures. When his mother asks him to try and persuade his sister to stop dating a Mexican immigrant, Stan tells his mother to stuff it. His sister should be able to date whoever she wants. As a boy, Robert and his brother were serious athletes and sports fans. They would watch their favorite athletes on TV, many of whom were black, and study their moves and try to emulate them. They'd stuff pillows down their shirt and throw blocks on each other as though they were members of the fearsome foursome, the celebrated defensive line of the LA Rams. On the basketball court, they'd model their jump shot on Walt Frazier's form. Willie Mays was a hero and Roberto Clemente. It wasn't just how his idols played that mattered to Robert as he developed as a young man and athlete. It was the political and cultural obstacles they'd overcome and their per perseverance and moral strength. 
Robert read biographies and autobiographies of his favorite athletes, Lensmeyer writes, and consequently he learned about and had to try and make sense of the racism and death threats that Hank Aaron faced as he chased Babe Ruth's home run record in baseball. Athletics for Robert were not only scenes for the display of physical skill, but also moral dramas that taught him about intolerance and that it was okay to accept and emulate people of color. What comes through in so many of these interviews is that racial conflict is not something that happens exclusively or even primarily between black people and white people. It's a drama that plays out within white groups and within the individual psyches of white people. Perhaps the most interesting example of this white-on-white -white conflict shows up again in Frank's life in the tug of war between his professional persona at the high school, where the expectations are liberal and multicultural, and the role he inhabits when he's with his buddies at their weekly poker games. At work, he feels as though he has to carefully measure every word he says on racially sensitive topics, for fear that if he says the wrong thing, his coworkers, all of whom are white, may tag him as a racist. At the poker games, it's the opposite. Racist talk is rewarded. The social danger is in being too equalitarian. Maybe I'm not a racist, he tells Lensmeyer, but in that subculture, down in the basement, I'll go way out on a limb and say some pretty horrible things because I'm rewarded by other people that are functioning in a subculture mentality. One result of this split for Frank is that there's nowhere he can talk about race in complex and ambivalent and inevitably clumsy ways. There's no one with whom he can talk through his jumbled thoughts and impulses in order perhaps to arrive over time at a more integrated and coherent perspective. In the high spaces, the danger is that he'll say the wrong things and be shamed. In the low spaces, the danger is that he'll shame his friends if he dissents from their racism. In either case, there's anxiety, confusion, and the potential for rejection. It is, in microcosm, almost a perfect example of the polarity of our national discourse on race and the distortions it produces. They're the high spaces of the dominant liberal cultural establishment where a wrong word or phrase or thought on race can get one shunned or excommunicated or forced to do public penance. And there are the low spaces of the right-wing media and political establishment where racism is more or less tolerated and contempt is reserved for those who would stake their identities on calling it out. What get lo gets lost in both spaces is how unstable the racial identity and racial politics of many white people is particularly the racial identity and politics of many of the people who buy into racist ideas and stereotypes. Frank doesn't always like who he is in the basement with his buddies. William doesn't want to be the racist his sister says he is. If Dolores had to do it all over again, maybe she'd take to the streets. Even Uncle Norman, somewhere deep down in his drowning soul, wants to be something other than the racist he knows he is. There are, in other words, conscious desires to, do, to be better, to do better, to contribute to racial connection and alliance. And that's just the conscious stuff. The ambivalent white unconscious is, if anything, even more unstable and contested territory, where fears of the other don't simply clash with desires for communion. They are brothers to them, born of the same undifferentiated welter of fear and longing and, and self-loathing. <laughs> It's understandable in confronting this stew of racial confusion that the left has adopted the strategy it has, which is to erect powerful taboos around racist language and symbols, to shame and punish those who violate the taboos, and to aggressively police the outer boundaries of the taboos so that even accidental and unconscious trespasses are flagged and tagged. It's a way of bringing clarity, bright lines, and hard principles to messiness. It shifts the burden of self-defense from people of color to white people in a way that's hard not to see as just after so many centuries of white people commanding the moralizing heights. It also happens to work. Racism hasn't gone away, but explicitly racist language is increasingly unacceptable in public discourse. Cultural production is vastly more representative of the multiracial population of America. White people on the whole are more sensitive about, about how they talk about and represent people of color. And people of color have agency in telling the story of race in America to, to a degree they never have before. These are good things. They are, in fact, some of the signal moral accomplishments of our present civilization. But there's a cost to erecting such robust taboos and then to expanding the sphere of their concern as much as we have, from racist talk and racist action to coded language and dog whistles to systemic racisms that are discernible only in patterns of disparate impact to cultural appropriation to theories of privilege that assign culpability for the absence of white experience of discrimination. What is suppressed in the high spaces will often get pushed down to the low spaces and from there seep out into the nation in the form of white backlash. That's a real strategic cost and one we seem to be paying right now. But more significant than any strategic cost 
which after all is worth paying if the cause is sufficiently just, is the moral cost. It is not okay sometimes to shame people for having racist thoughts, to punish them for an imperfect command of the increasingly Byzantine language of racial enlightenment, and to mark them by virtue of their whiteness as being born with the original sin of privilege. Treating people as the sum of their flaws, as defined by their worst qualities, can do violence to their complexity. It can lack compassion for the challenge of being human, which is to say frail and imperfect and only marginally capable at the best of times of exerting some rational control over our meat bodies and meat brains. It can set up a toxic power imbalance between those vested with the power to punish violations of the taboo and those who have violated it. And it cordons off, and this is both a moral and a strategic cost, it cordons off a whole range of possibilities and strategies for nudging unstable white racial identities in a productive direction. What, in other words, do we want to do with Frank? How do we want to talk about him, but more importantly, how do we want to talk to him? How do we take the sense he has that he wants to be better than he is with the, in the basement with his buddies, better than his father and uncle Norman were, and how do we nourish that? I don't know the answer exactly, but one place to start, I think, is with the fact that Tim Lensmeyer spent four hours with Frank, just four hours, and in that time had him reflecting on his father's hypocrisy, his own complicity with racism, with the racism of the basement culture, and his hopes that his children would be better than he was. Lensmeyer writes, Frank wished for a bigger, more expansive world for, his, for himself, his friends, his family. He hoped that his own children would act differently, be braver. He hoped that his own children would not stay silent in the face of explicitly racist talk and jokes, as he and his father often did. If we had millions of Tims, we could send them out into the white world as missionaries of empathetic racial listening. They would commune with us white people and ask good questions and gently prod. Over time, they would help us get in touch with our better racial selves and fan the flames of our commitment to a more racially just society. Unfortunately, we don't have millions of Tims. And frankly, I'm not hopeful that some other solution will emerge, at least in the short term. Everything right now seems so stacked against it. What hope I do have, however, arises from how simple in truth the key questions are. Who do we want Frank to be in Dolores and William and Stan and Robert? And who do we want to be in relation to them? What do we want to see in them? What do we want them to see in us? Do we want to look down in judgment? Or do we want to reach out firm and confident in our own principles and ask for the best in them? And what could we accomplish together if we began from a place of more trust and goodwill rather than suspicion and ready condemnation, however justified those negative feelings may be after so much damage done and so much hurt inflicted? I think we could accomplish a lot, and I think we'd be surprised at how eager the Franks of the worlds would be to join us. Thank you. Well, certainly, uh, Wisconsin had a big role in uh, 2016. There's no doubt about that. And uh, Frank and others yeah. probably were right in that mix. Okay, questions. Yes, Lynn, hold on a second. Here comes the microphone. Have you tried it? Have you had these conversations yourself? Um, to some extent, you know, I... Um, um, a lot, of, a lot on social media. I have, a, I have a bad or possibly good habit, I'm not sure. I think it's usually when after a really stressful day or maybe I've had a fight with my wife, I go get into conversations slash arguments with people who disagree with me on social media. Um, so I have. I mean, I, I, I make a practice of, at least in that context or whenever I can, it's not always about race, but of sort of talking to people who disagree with me pretty profoundly. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, it is explicitly about, about race, and sometimes it feels like it is, even if that's not explicit. Uh, I had an ongoing conversation with um, a sort of family friend, not a close family friend, um, about who, who ended up voting for Trump. Um, and yet it was really fascinating on the race front, because I think a lot of the stuff that he ended up saying about Obama and Hillary Clinton um, and Black Lives Matter and, and kind of what was at stake in this election um, had, a, had a racial tinge to it and I guess from my perspective seems like maybe if you could trace it back was rooted in some, some ideas that I would think of as kind of racist. Um, 
But he was also a guy who talked about, was very defensive on that front, and was a guy who talked about how in the 80s he had marched in anti-apartheid anti protests was he, when he was in college. So, yeah, boy, it's, I mean, it's confusing. I mean, and, it, and it's hard, and, and, it, and it is the question of, like, how do you talk about something like that? This is a guy who has, clearly has really explicit, in his mind, commitments to, um, racial justice and equality, but if you get him going on Black Lives Matter and Obama, it starts to feel a little um, icky. Dan, let me ask you a question. Now, get, 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 the, yeah. the, if you look back in history on this issue of politics and race, you know, it, the champions were people like Republican Winthrop Rockefeller, like Everett Dirksen, that other and on the other side of the issue were Democrats like John McClellan and J. William Fulbright who signed the Southern Manifesto. So is it party or is it philosophy that is the divisive thing? Because again, no one, I mean, no one was more a champion than Rockefeller. He, uh, and, and, and for all his, for all the criticism people made, it was Eisenhower that sent the troops to Little Rock over a Democratic governor, Faubus. So how do we equate that in this? Um, boy, <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, I mean, it's definitely not party in a kind of timeless and universal way, because you're absolutely right, you know, and, 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 and but it, it, it's something, it's identity, I mean, it's identity, it's tribe, it's, it's, it, it's culture in some sense. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about and, you know, trying to, to kind of differentiate in my mind. You know, when I said, like, sometimes there's a strategic cost to be paid and you have to pay that price. You know, I think, I don't know if this is an actual quote or just something apocryphal, but you know, I mean, is it, I feel like it said that, that LBJ knew or said something like when he passed the civil rights legislation, Andrew probably know this, but like, that he just lost the South, right? That he probably lost the South. Well, okay, but that was, that was true. And yeah, that was yet, that was something that had to be done, right? And that was a strategic cost worth paying. And so it's hard to, now it seems like these things, and what's so frustrating about it is these things get so bundled up with the sort of tribe or the side of the culture war that you're on, that people end up absorbing ideas, I think, that they would not necessarily subscribe to if it was not, didn't become attached to the particular identity that feels so central to who they are and who their friends in their, in their community are. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I don't, so when I was saying at the beginning that like you could sort of, you could, you could flip this, you could, so this was sort of, a, this was sort of speaking to the left, but I mean, um, I, I could have written a different talk talking to people on the right, which is do, do from my perspective, do you want to be the home for, do you want your identity to be bound up with this kind of confused and murky entangled racial resentment and insecurity? Like, surely there are plenty of people who don't, and, are, and, and don't know what to do about that, you know, and you will hear conservatives talking about how, you know, why, you know, lamenting that more black voters should, should affiliate with Republicans because what have the Democrats have, I mean, I think Trump said something, what have the Democrats done for them, and, you know, over the last few decades? But that's not, a, I mean, what have you done? What have you done on the right to create a space that is, that is, um, pushing back against this particular strain of kind of racially tinged conservatism. And, 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 and frankly, you know, we would all be better off, even if it meant, for my side, losing, losing black votes, we would all be better off if the Republican Party saw a real space for themselves to, you know, and it would be different than the, the left-wing one, but to, to advocate for and push kind of policies that, that promoted kind of racial reconciliation. Yes, we have a question back here, yes. Thank you uh, so much. We had an opportunity to meet earlier. For everyone else, I'm Crystal C. Mercer, and I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School. Uh, I really appreciate your talk about privilege and race, and it's an ongoing conversation we've been having as students. I uh, think it's very, very complex. So my question for you is, how do people who have privilege use that same privilege to begin that complex work of dismantling racism? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think, you know, and I think, um, 
how do we do the work of dismantling racism? So some of it, and the primary part of it for me, and I, and I, have, a, I have a whole other thing I could have written about this sort of privilege discourse, which I don't like, and not because I think there's a lack of racism in our society, but I actually think that the privilege discourse is one that exacerbates some of these tensions that I was talking about. So, so one thing would be to talk less about privilege um, and to talk more about injustice and, and a sort of collective, so, so I would like all of us, black, white, brown, yellow, red, to be um, focusing as much as we can on policies that would create more equality and would diminish the sort of the, the um, you know, di difference in uh, wealth between whites and other racial groups that would, that would, you know, that would diminish the you know disciplinary gap in schools between white and black students. All of these things I think are 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 problems, real problems, reflective of our racist history and 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 our racist present that have solutions, but that are solutions that we could commit to collectively as as Americans who are kind of aware of race uh, and racism. Um, and so, I don't know that I have anything that interesting to say, like, is it strategic, because that's not my thing, but I guess what, you know, but what I would say in a more conceptual way is I don't like the privileged discourse because I, it, it feels divisive and it feels like it's, in a sense, it's almost like, um, it, it's shifting the kind, as I said, you know, it, it, it's shifting the burden of, of proof of self-defense, um, which it's hard not to see as just, but I also think it's a bad strategic idea to uh, premise a sort of, or hope for a coalition, a multiracial coalition that's premised in part on one big, big group of it and still the biggest group in America, you know, starting from a place of acknowledging its own original sin and sort of moral deficit, which is what it feels like. I think that's a, there are people on whom, in whom that will produce a racial commitment, but I think there are too many people in whom that will produce a kind of political reaction. Yes, Lynn, right back here at the back. Thank you. Uh, uh, today's topic is people who have left the left. Are you implying somehow that uh, the racial problems we face uh, the, that you've mentioned at some length are related to uh, people like Ronald Reagan and Christopher Hitchens leaving the left? Um, so for those two, I would say race was not, I mean, I would say race was not the essential um, factor. So if you're talking about somebody like Reagan, um, who was, a, was, was not a leftist, but was a New Deal liberal for sort of the first half of his life, essentially, and started moving right after World War II, uh, and the real kind of lever for him was, was the Cold War and the sort of communism and anti-communism, and, and the degree to which aspects of the left were attached to either actual communism or socialism or were opposed, were sort of anti-anti-communist. Um, I don't think that was the reason why he, he, I mean, he ended up getting involved in all sorts of uh, racial politics as governor of California and then, and then as president, but it was not the thing that pushed him over. Um, and for Hitchens, for Christopher Hitchens, you know, it, it was all foreign policy stuff. I mean, it was all, you know, um, you know, what, what he came to see is the sort of attack on Western civilization from Islamofascism. Um, the people for whom it was an essential, essential uh, factor um, were Norman Podhoritz, um, who sort of uh, moved to the right in, in the 1960s and 70s in reaction to the new left. But in particular, one of the guys I write about is a guy named David Horowitz, who was raised a communist, was one of the early new left activists out in the Bay Area in the, in the early 60s and late 60s, um, and I think would be a leftist, still alive, would, would be a leftist to this day, um, but in the mid-1970s, he was friends with, uh, he was a supporter of the Black Panthers in the Bay Area and friends with Huey Newton. Um, and they were looking for somebody to do their books and he recommended a woman who had worked for him at the journal that he edited. And she went um, and worked for them and then disappeared a few months later. And um, washed, her body washed up on the, on the shore of the bay and it became pretty apparent that the, the Panthers had killed her. Maybe because um, by that point in their history, they were involved in some pretty illegal stuff, not political stuff, just kind of um, just pure 
sort of illegal stuff that she may have found out about. And, and Horowitz went into, a, went into a real tailspin, um, deep depression, broke up his marriage, kind of his life fell apart. Um, but one of the things that happened, and one of the things that I think is kind of in the backstory to this piece is he went around to all his friends on the Bay Area left and said, you know, can you believe, you know, this group, the Panthers we've been supporting and lionizing, they, they killed this woman we know. And everybody said, yeah, maybe, but don't, you know, don't talk about it, don't make a big deal about it. You know, the FBI is after the Panthers and the police and all of which was true, but don't make it. And, 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 and it persuaded him to a degree far beyond what I think, but he pers it persuaded him that there was a deep, deep sickness in the left when it came to race. And then it produced all these sorts of kind of dysfunctions that prohibited us from seeing the issue clearly. And I mean, and to this day, I mean, he will, he will, um, you don't need to talk to him for more than five minutes, you know, to get him going on that topic and how sick he thinks the left is on race. Um, and I think, you know, if you're just talking about this with the contemporary scene, like, uh, you know, I, I don't, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the first person or even the, you know, 1,000th person, person to say this. I mean, race was obviously a factor, right, in, in, in electing Trump. And, 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 you know, he framed it that way, and, and he set himself up in opposition to groups like uh, Black Lives Matter. And, you know, so, I mean, that, I, I have no question but that race in complicated ways has been pushing certain people, white people primarily, to the right. Um, in our sort of present situation. Yes, Mr. Dietz, right here. Racism uh, increase or decrease after eight years of a black president? <laughs> um, boy, I think that. I think there's a few different axes on which I would, I, I'm not gonna give you a simple answer to that. I think there's a few different axes on which I think it's profoundly important that we had a black president and in terms of, you know, when you, you think particularly about children growing up and, and, you know, black children, white children, Hispanic children, and, and, their, and their sense of, um, you know, who can achieve the highest levels of American cultural, culture, who we can sort of celebrate and lionize um, what it means to be black in this country. I just, I, I can't imagine that hasn't had a profound, having a black president, a black first family, having a White House um, that's so diverse. I can't imagine that hasn't had a sort of profound and positive effect on people on that axis. Um, I think, so, that, so that's one axis. Another one is we are just in the, we, you know, we are in the midst of this kind of increasing polarization. And one of the things that has happened, you know, which I think is totally toxic. And, and you know, and I, I put this, you know, I'm talking about the left, but I put this on the right. I mean, I just listened to, you know, Fox News or Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or these, those, these folks, and it just seems like they're feeding just a kind of racially toxic poison into the ears of their listeners on a regular basis. And so, is that increasing a certain kind of racism? Like, I just think it has to be. Um, I don't think it's the fault of Barack Obama, but I think, it may have increased in, in intensity in reaction to him. So I don't know where we are. I still in some sense, though I ended this on a kind of pessimistic note, like I'm still in some sense a, a long-term racial optimist. Um, I mean, I don't think we'll get to the mountaintop, but, um, or the promised land, I'm sorry. Like, I, I don't think we'll get to the promised land, but, but I think things, broadly speaking, are, are getting better. And I, I think, you know, in, in 30 or 40 years, you know, if it all doesn't fall apart, we'll probably be in a better place. And we'll look at the election of Barack Obama as a kind of signal, sort of seminal kind of milestone in that process. Yeah, got a question right here. Yes. Um, it seems to me that the left over the years has gone to a strategy of encouraging victimization. There's, over the years, there's been an increasing number of groups that identify as victims to where there's so many of those groups now, they're actually the majority of the population. At the same time, they're saying they're being victimized by the larger society. Do you think that that is a healthy, uh, well, I don't use healthy, but a good strategy, and do you think that is part of what we're talking about here today? Um, so, 
I would say first, before answering that, I mean, the answer is like, no, I don't think it's great. I would say it's, but I'd say it's the right too. I mean, I'd say I listen to Donald Trump and some of those people I was talking about and it all seems victimization to me. I mean, you know, I, there was some tweet that somebody, you know, I was looking at this morning that was like, you know, Donald Trump just gave a, gave a speech at CPAC about, that was all about kind of marginalization and alienation and he's the president and his party controls, you know, controls the government. So, so yeah, I think that, and, and I'm not, um, you know, my, my wife is a, is a historian of psychology and has written more than I have about kind of these broad shifts in our sort of understanding of ourselves and, and you know, how we think of the self and, 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 and think of it in relation to society. So this is not my area of expertise, but it seems like, it seems like we live in some kind of, you know, post-traumatic or traumatic age where that's a really powerful, um, understandable, desirable strategy for all of us, space for us to be in, to make sort of make sort of moral claims on other people, to make probably financial claims on other people, to just sort of and, and I don't you know, I don't know what to make of it. I think I think it's probably it's one of those things, you know, whether you're talk when you're talking about to individual people who've experienced trauma, you know, and I would include it, you know, so if we're talking about all those groups who maybe are talking about being victimized, we're talking about transgender people or gay people or black people or Hispanic people like like, I have no question of the legitimacy of their experience of being um, victimized or traumatized. And, and, and so it's incredibly difficult to sort of credit that, which is real, but also say something like, as a, as a strategy for our society to adopt, for people across the political and racial spectrum to adopt, it might be one that's, that's corrosive of, of some you know, of, of cohesion, of social cohesion. So I, I, and I think it is, but it's, it's just so hard to like know what to do with that because the claims themselves are, are often really, really legitimate. Yes, ma'am, we have a question right here. My provocative question. <laughs> okay. um, I'm hearing a lot of buzzwords. It's the usual buzzwords you hear with any kind of racial yeah. conversation. And when you introduced yourself, you said, I'm coming from this left background. Yeah. Something that you're kind of in an ivory tower. So do you have any friends that you don't discuss politics with who are black or Hispanic or other groups? Because sometimes what I see with people who come from possibly this your same political thing is, mm -hmm. gosh, you know, I'd really like to know some people who aren't like me. And uh, so it concerns me because I grew up, I went to college in the 60s I and mean, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I've talked with people that I would assume are white racist, and they tell me that they've got um, um, a black granddaughter, you know, there was, so tell me, you know, in your personal life, are you, do you hang around with anybody else except folks who think like you? <laughs> um, so he hangs around with students. Yeah, so um, I wish I, I mean, I, I wish I had a more diverse, you know, so, you know, I live in Austin, Texas, which is like, you know, deep, deep blue, right? You know, and a lot of my friends are academics and writers, and so, so, um, to a pretty, I was going to say to a pretty extraordinary extent, but actually to a pretty, like, normal extent these days when we've sort of self-selected ourselves into these, you know, I'm mostly, I mean, do I have uh, diverse friends? Yes. Like, I have black friends, Hispanic friends, Asian friends, not many conservative friends, frankly. Like, there's the less diversity, less, less political diversity than racial diversity. Um, and, um, and I, I, you know, I mean, whatever, I'm a political writer. Like, I talk to everybody that I can about these things. I, you know, make my wife uncomfortable often talking about these things. So, I think I'm in a bubble, and that's a fair question. Um, I think I may be in less of a bubble than a lot of people because I make sort of active effort to, to engage people. Um, from other perspectives, um, but but I, you know I think it was, it's interesting. Just like uh, last night, we got to uh, yesterday we got to Little Rock and walking around, um, and, and it seems like I mean Austin is a really white city, 
and it's a pretty segregated city, not by law, but just by, you know, economics and, and culture. Um, Little Rock looks totally different. I mean, I was just kind of looking, I went on Wikipedia and looked at the kind of um, racial demographics of Little Rock, and I think it was about half white, about 40-some percent black. Um, I think I would have a different experience. I don't, I don't know what it's like um, for people in Little Rock, whether there's, there's more conversation in, in, in across races, um, but I would probably have a different experience if I was if I lived here, than if I lived in uh, than if than I do in Austin. Corey, back here. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, this question probably follows up on some of the comments that you've made. A uh, week ago today, Michael Novak passed away. He was a Catholic philosopher that moved from being a leftist in the 60s to in the 80s writing pretty impassioned defenses of capitalism as a driver of morality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been thinking about that over the last week or so as an Arkansan uh, who has seen our state move perhaps not so much philosophically from left to right, but certainly from a democratic state governance to a Republican state governance. And uh, much more Republican orthodoxy changes to the state budget and the overall economic climate. And I was just wondering if you could speak uh, to the, the view of budgeting and economics intertwined with morality, uh, both from the left and from the right. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, um, let me see. I'll see if I have anything useful to say on that. Like, I think that, um, you know, I've read a little bit, but not a lot of a, of a kind of more sort of theological perspective on on capitalism as a as a as a moral system. I would say I'm not. I personally am not anti-capitalist. Um, I, I see it. You know, whoever it was was you know uh, worst system that was ever invented. Other you know, aside from every other set of that's capitalism or democracy. But saying that worst system that was ever invented, aside from every other system, um, I think. So this is all I'll say, because I, I don't know that I have an enormous amount to say. This is, this is all I'll say, is I've had, so when I engage in these conversations with people, you know, online, and we're not talking about professors or theologians, or, you know, regular educated citizens, um, it seems strange to me the extent to which the, you know, economic orthodoxy of, of conservatives in this country is, it's not that there aren't, you know, smart theologians who can find a way to defend it, but it often, when people talk about the values of low taxation and, you know, anti-redistribution, it seems so disconnected from basically every moral and theor theological system we've developed as, you know, as a, as a species over the last few thousand years. Um, the idea that, you know, the sort of individual sort of profit of the, you know, the profit and, and um, Success of the individual is 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 that you know by which we should measure everything. I, it, it's not that it's not that that means we should be against capitalism because it's for greed, but it means that there seems to be missing a real kind of sophisticated moral perspective on capitalism from within the right, um, which I would love to see. Uh, and it's not that the, I mean there there are people out there intellectuals out there who will talk about that, but I mean it's not it's not a meaningful part of the kind of conservative you know, policy-making coalition. Um, so I'm not an anti-capitalist, uh, and a lot of people on the left are. A lot of people on the left, I think, have a really linear, like, it's, it's a system that privileges uh, making money and, and, and advancing oneself, and therefore it's greed, and therefore it's immoral. And I, I don't have that perspective on political systems. I, don't, I think it's, a, it's generally a bad idea. If I, you know, if I learned anything from reading about all these people and reading about communism, it's generally a bad idea to, to think that we can premise a, a political or an economic system on a kind of bright line uh, moralism like that. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Dan for being here. This is... Uh...